Hello, and welcome to this Regulatory Transparency Project webinar call. My name is Kayla Kleist, and I'm Assistant Director of the Regulatory Transparency Project here at the Federal Society. Today, September 29, 2022, we're excited to host a panel discussion entitled Private Rights of Action in Data Policy Settlements. Joining us today is a stellar panel of experts who bring a range of views to this discussion. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call, as the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. Today, we are pleased to have with us as our moderator, Jennifer Huddleston, who is a policy counsel at NetChoice, where she analyzes technology-related legislative issues at both the state and federal level. Portfolio and research interests include issues related to data privacy, antitrust, online content moderation, including Section 230, transportation innovation, and regulatory state. I'll leave it to her to introduce the rest of our fantastic panel. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature, so our speakers will have access to them when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, Thank you for being with us today. Ms. Huddleston, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kayla, and thank you to the Regulatory Transparency Project for hosting this and so many great conversations around data privacy and data security, which are certainly growing topics of interest um, throughout, throughout the last few years. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Jennifer Huddleston and I serve as policy counsel with NetChoice. And I'm very excited to have a lively conversation today on what has been really one of those big questions when it comes to what should potential data privacy laws look like? And that is the question around what, if anything, should policymakers consider when it comes to a private right of action? I'm joined today by Andy Kingman and Keir Lamont. Um, starting with Andy, Andy is the president of Mariner Strategies. And among other clients, he represents the State Privacy and Security Coalition, which works on data privacy and cybersecurity issues in all 50 states. As a public policy advocate with experience in compliance, he brings a unique and substantive perspective to discussions on how to best increase consumer privacy protections while maintaining the operational workability and cybersecurity protections for businesses. He is nationally recognized as a thought leader in the field, and in 2020, he was named as one of 25 attorneys um, in Massachusetts Lawyers Weekly up-and-coming lawyers list. I'm also joined by Keir Lamont. Keir serves as a senior counsel with the Future of Privacy Forum's U.S. legislation team. In this role, he supports policymaker education and independent research analysis concerning federal, state, and local consumer privacy laws and regulations. Previously, he held positions with CCIA, the Computer and Communications Industry Association, and the Program on Data and Governance at Ohio State University. Keir has a JD from Georgetown University Law Center and a BA in Political Science and Economics from the University of Florida. So before I turn it over to our panelists, I think it's important to kind of understand where this debate currently is when it comes to data privacy when it, and private rights of action in data privacy legislation. We've seen over the past few years that the question of enforcement is often a key question at both a state and federal level. One of those enforcement options put forward often is a private right of action or the right of individual consumers or classes to sue for potential violations of a state or federal law. This has had many critics as well as many proponents. Critics often point to the fact that the American litigation system has resulted in oftentimes an over litigious approach that can result in negative consequences of a private right of action, particularly with statutory damages. We can look to the examples in Illinois with the BIPA, the Biometric Information Privacy Act, that has resulted in significant litigation over issues such as photo tagging, as well as, uh, as amusement park uh, uh, annual pass identification, oftentimes leading to, even at its most, consumers not having access to certain technologies, as we saw with the Google Art selfie match. On the other hand, uh, proponents of private rights of action often question whether or not there are enough resources from government agencies to support act active uh, engagement around the issue of privacy. So with that, I would like to turn to, to each of our panelists with an opening question kind of of the with regards to what how they see enforcement and how they see a private right of action playing into this is a private right of action an ideal enforcement mechanism for data privacy legislation or if not what would you say is the preferred enforcement mechanism 
And do you think there is a need for any guardrails on private right of actions or any best lessons learned looking at what we've seen with existing legislation? And I'll start with, with Andy. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jennifer. And thanks, everybody, for taking a few minutes here this afternoon to um, to chat about this. Yeah, Jennifer, you know, I think we've seen um, an interesting consensus form over the past several months, particularly at the state level, which is which is where I focus. Um, you know, since the California Consumer Privacy Act first passed in uh, 2018, uh, we've seen four states subsequently pass privacy legislation. Um, and although those four states, you know, are kind of working from a different framework than the California model, what we've seen is that there is consistency um, in at least one aspect of that legislation, and that is that there is no private right of action. Uh, now, in the California legislation, there is a limited pride of right, private right of action for data breaches, um, but not for privacy violations. I think the fact that um, we've seen states as diverse as Utah and Connecticut um, pass uh, legislation with similar enforcement mechanisms, uh, both with uh, almost universal bipartisan support, um, really shows that there's a consensus that's formed uh, that private rights of action are not the best way to um, enforce privacy violations. And there are a few reasons for that, I think. Um, the first is that privacy violations are very difficult to prove actual harm. Um, and the second is that um, because of that, uh, it is really ripe for abuse, not by consumers, um, but by the plaintiff's bar um, who can use, uh, you know, vague or very complex um, requirements in a law uh, to leverage uh, literally millions of dollars in e-discovery costs uh, from, from uh, defendants in order to get to a settlement. So, um, you know, I think the fact that all five states with a comprehensive privacy law uh, and two out of the three states uh, with uh, more specific biometric privacy laws, um, I, I think there's a pretty clear pro policy preference that has been expressed there. Great. And Kier, your thoughts on the, the same question? Sure. So thank you, Jennifer and RTP, for having me on. Uh, so look, private rights of action are one of a suite of potential enforcement mechanisms that can be included in privacy frameworks. My organization tries to take a holistic case-by-case -case approach to analyzing privacy legislation, and we don't have any one answer to the question of whether any particular element of a proposal is or is not ideal. Now, Andy is absolutely correct about the emerging state consensus against including private rights of action in privacy legislation. However, I think it is also important to note that as the current federal political climate stands, a broad yet tailored private right of action has emerged as part of the compromise that can potentially get policymakers in Washington to, at long last, enact federal privacy legislation. This summer, we saw bipartisan, bicameral work in Congress to advance the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, or ADPA, highlighted by an overwhelming 53 to 2 vote to advance the proposal out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. ADPA includes a private right of action, and I can tell you those two nay votes had nothing to do with its enforcement provisions. So at this point, I'm not sure how tenable it remains to try to hold a hard line against any sort of private right of action in federal privacy legislation. The center of gravity in Washington has shifted dramatically over the past four years. So potentially another way of answering your question uh, the attributes of federal privacy legislation, at least, that could be considered ideal, may be the ones that are necessary to finally get federal privacy legislation over the finish line. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is that a federal privacy law is sorely needed. Individuals in 45 states lack baseline privacy rights. Businesses are facing an increasingly complex patchwork of state laws. And the lack of a privacy law is undermining America's leadership and global economic competitiveness. 
Uh, I would also like to stress that a private right of action should not be viewed as an all or nothing proposition. As you allude to, Jennifer, there are many guardrails and tweaks that can be made to a private right of action in order to protect consumers while mitigating the risk of a deluge of nuisance lawsuits that Andy references. Uh, the current version of that federal proposal, ADPA, includes many such provisions in its private right of action, and I'll name a few. Uh, the right of action wouldn't be available until two years after the law would take effect. There would not be statutory damages for bare procedural violations of the act. It would only permit action in federal courts, not state courts, raising some very interesting Article 3 standing questions. Uh, in many cases, it requires persons looking to sue to provide prior notice to both regulators and the party alleged to be in violation, uh, including an opportunity to cure. And finally, there would be protections for certain very small companies. So these are all examples of levers that can be set and adjusted as policymakers consider whether to include a private right of action in privacy legislation. Thank you, Kier. And, you know, I think it's often easy for those of us who spend a lot of time in the privacy space and, you know, talking about it on online, on Twitter and things like that to very quickly assume that everyone knows exactly what we're talking about when we start throwing out acronyms like CPRA and CCPA and the Colorado law versus the Virginia law and things like that. And while I know a lot of our attendees are, are likely attorneys or are working in the law and so are familiar with the idea of private right of action, I'd like us to, to take a little bit of a step back to talk about what it is that we're actually talking about. So Kira, Andy, could, could either of you kind of jump in and for those who aren't as familiar, speak briefly to what are the kind of different types of private rights of action we see and particularly this question that tends to emerge a lot in the data privacy space of what do we mean by the difference in a private right of action with statutory damages versus a private right of action for actual damages? Yeah, sure. I'll start and, and Kira, if you would like to jump in, feel free. Um, you know, when we talk about a private right of action, it's effectively the ability for individual consumers um, or a class of consumers to sue um, a company uh, for a particular violation of a statute. Um, and whether a bill has statutory damages, which sets out particular dollar amounts per violation, um, which as you can imagine, when companies have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of customers, um, can add up very, very quickly, um, or whether it's actual damages. And again, going to that issue of um, you know, privacy harms uh, being very difficult to prove, um, you know, can can be a little bit of a different uh, gauge of, of the uh, amount of uh, both compensation that a, a plaintiff could receive and also the amount of uh, litigation risk uh, or regulatory risk that a business is able to take on. Uh, I think that's right, and I would also just note that there are certainly different types of private rights of action that we have seen emerge in just the existing privacy laws we have in the books already. You have laws like the Video Privacy Protection Act and Telephone Consumer Protection Act, under which any violation is considered a per se harm that permits individuals to challenge in court. Uh, you also have laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or Privacy Act of 1974, that require plaintiffs to demonstrate that the law has been violated and some degree of serious injury has occurred. You also have laws that establish different intent or knowledge standards uh, concerning the violation. Uh, for example, the Fair Credit Reporting Act has a willfully fails to comply standard that provides for higher penalties if uh, that has been shown. And of course, uh, as I think Andy has alluded to earlier with uh, the existing California law, uh, many of these privacy laws uh, contain dozens uh, of both consumer rights and business obligations, which may cause greater or lesser risks of harm if there's been a violation. And a private right of action doesn't necessarily need to apply to every particular aspect of a privacy law. I kind of mentioned this in our, the opening as I was introducing you to, but one of the reasons that private right of action tends to get so much discussion 
are some of the unique facets of the American legal system, notably the lack of a loser pays rules, questions around class actions and attorney's fees and, and questions about who a private right of action with statutory damages would really benefit, whether, whether this is an enforcement option that is just kind of creating excess litigation or whether it's something that can actually impact the impacted consumers. As I mentioned, we've seen a lot of concerns about this, particularly in response to the Illinois law that we'll dig into a little bit um, later in this panel. But I'm also just curious as to, to your thoughts on, and I'll start with Kier this time, of how does the American legal system and its approach to litigation differ from other, other legal systems, particularly the European legal system, and does that impact what impact a private right of action might have? Uh, so look, Jennifer, do not let the accent fool you. I am not a European attorney. <laughs> I am not an expert on uh, litigation in Europe, though I do understand that due to both uh, legal and cultural differences, there does tend to be less of a litigious climate uh, in Europe. And in the EU, it's often said that regulators tend to adopt a more principle-based approach and collaborative perspective to industry compliance. Um, however, I think it is worth noting that within the European overarching privacy law, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, that law does establish some mechanisms for individuals to take action to enforce their privacy interests. Uh, you have Article 77, right to lodge a complaint with a supervisory authority, uh, Article 79, right to an effective judicial remedy against a control or a processor, uh, and Article 80, right, to have a nonprofit organization lodge a complaint on an individual's behalf. So certainly if there was a broad private right of action in the US space, uh, I think that would operate differently than how we see the self-help mechanisms of European law operate in the uh, uh, four, five, six years now that that law has been in effect. But I think it's not kind of accurate to point at Europe as necessarily a reason why uh, U.S. privacy legislation should or should not include a private right of action. Yeah, I, I think that's generally correct. I'm also not a, an expert on the European uh, legal system, um, but I think the loser pays model is a really critical component here. Um, we don't have that uh, in general here in the United States. Um, none of the privacy laws that we've referenced here in the United States, I think, have have a loser pays model. Um, and, you know, that really can serve as a way of deterring some of the more frivolous or questionable lawsuits. Um, you know, there are some mechanisms in the ADPPA, the, the federal bill, that, um, while aren't a loser pays model, do have some threshold um questions that need to be answered or uh, threshold procedural uh, uh, threshold procedural issues uh, before uh, the uh, plaintiff's attorneys can institute a, a lawsuit. So um, there are some of those, but I think that that loser pays model um, is a very, very critical distinction. Um, and to Keir's point, um, you know, I think in the European litigation system, again, there generally is a much more collaborative spirit with regulators where, you know, entities who may find themselves in violation or have been accused of uh, being in violation um, are able to uh, have opportunities to remedy that before it gets to a litigation scenario. So again, uh, not an expert, but, you know, I think there are some critical distinctions um, process wise. Uh, that that really, you know, require an extra look at Europe as a, a model or or anything along those lines. Well, and to be clear, Kier, I was mainly trying to uh, keep the who got to start first uh, fair, not not pulling on any <laughs> any accents or uh, or anything there. Um, I do want to turn back to the U.S. and to the states. Something that I do know you are both an expert on. Uh, Andy, in your your opening statement, you alluded to the fact that private right of action has, or or a movement away from a private right of action has become the trend at a state level. Um, you and you mentioned particularly the the two out of the three states that have passed 
Biometric Information Privacy Act legislation. So some bills that some laws that have been around a, a bit longer than the, the current more general consumer data privacy bills lack a private right of action. In contrast, the state of Illinois has a private right of action. And, and as I mentioned earlier, this has been quite a, a subject of much debate. So for both of you, but starting with Andy, what can we learn about the impact that a private right of action, such as that we see in the, the Illinois BIPA legislation has on consumers and businesses with looking at the experience of Illinois versus the, the states of Texas and Washington who passed similar legislation, but without this private right of action? Yeah, thanks. Great question. You know, I think Illinois is sort of the poster child, um, interestingly, on on uh, both by the business community and by consumer advocates. Um, you know, consumer advocates tend to tout uh, Illinois' law as the strongest privacy law in the country because of its private right of action. Um, the business community tends to look at it as an example of uh, where class action lawsuits have become an absolute cottage industry. Um, you know, I think there are a few, few lessons to be learned here. Um, BIPA has some very unique aspects to it. The, the first being it was passed in 2008. So less than a year after the invention of the iPhone, um, there's a law regulating biometrics. The way that the online ecosystem has evolved um, does not really match up at all with the structure of that bill. Um, it really uh, effectively puts strict liability on companies who don't comply. Um, but there are any number of companies, as privacy laws have evolved to recognize just the explosion of vendors to, um, to the consumer-facing entity, uh, BIPA doesn't make that distinction. As a result, there are, you know, scores and scores of companies who are unable, literally unable to comply with BIPA's requirements because they never interact with the consumer. This in turn has created uh, what I, I think is accurate to describe as a cottage industry of class action lawsuits here. Um, these are for relatively, you know, many of these are for relatively minor infractions, um, and they are extremely, extremely costly. Uh, as Jennifer, as you mentioned at the top, um, I have worked uh, not only on the policy side, but also on the compliance side, helping companies uh, work to comply with various privacy laws. I can tell you when it comes to Illinois, more and more companies, uh, are just looking at Illinois and saying, well, we won't offer, you know, our security services there, right? So we're not going to deploy services that might keep consumers more safe um, because the way that the law is structured doesn't allow us to operate without getting consent from people we think might be cyber criminals. Um, and uh, we're just not going to take the litigation risk there. Um, so as a result, there are real effects on consumers. Consumers do, are not able to avail themselves of the cybersecurity and anti-fraud protections that consumers in 49 other states have. Um, this is a real tangible danger. Um, there are other uh, uh, there are other consequences. Um, other types of services are not provided, uh, but you know, I think the real and, and most significant effect on consumers in Illinois is that security and anti-fraud uh, sector has really been driven out of the state uh, because they're simply not able to comply the way that the, the statute has been drawn up. Um, and, you know, the other piece of this is that um, consumers often do not see uh, real tangible benefit to these class action lawsuits. Um, often, the uh, in almost every case, the you know award uh, that they are getting is in the you know high tens of dollars, so maybe eighty, ninety, up to maybe a couple hundred dollars. So this is not um, a windfall for consumers when there are entities that have been found to uh, violate or who end up settling um, with the plaintiffs bar. Um, and just for some context, in the last five years, there have been over a thousand 
class action lawsuits filed. Um, Illinois state courts uh, ruled in 2018 that there was actually no concrete injury required to bring a lawsuit uh, under the statute. Um, and that really um, opened the floodgates for litigation in that state. So, you know, we, we've we seen it um, really explode as a, as a center for uh, litigation um, and really has failed to winnow down bad actors from good actors. Kier, do you have anything to, to add or any, any different thoughts? Sure. So uh, I actually might be willing to go a little bit further than uh, Andy on the uh, Illinois Biffa. I think that uh, outside of the plaintiff's bar or a privacy absolutist, you're actually going to have a very, very difficult time finding anyone who's willing to say that the private right of action in BIPA is operating in an ideal manner. However, when we look at BIPA, it was the basis for leading to a major settlement with a clear view AI uh, involving facial recognition, collection, and processing that many people found extremely, extremely objectionable. And when you look at those two other state biometric uh, privacy laws, uh, Texas and Washington state, I personally know of only one enforcement action carried out pursuant to either law. Uh, Andy might know more, but I believe that involved conduct that the business in question had already ceased uh, for, for other matters. So um, it's not clear to me that in the absence of a private right of action, Texas and Washington state have done that much to uh, advance biometric privacy for the citizens in either jurisdiction. So once again, I think this points to the fact that when we talk about private rights of action, they do not have to be an all or nothing proposition. And there are many levers and tweaks that we can pull in for policymakers thinking through how to create an ideal enforcement uh, situation. Yeah, you know, I think, um... First of all, you know, what I would say in terms of uh, uh, Washington and Texas, you know, many, many attorney general investigations are confidential. And so I think it's very difficult to to uh, pinpoint or assess the efficacy of those laws uh, based on, you know, enforcement, act, publicized enforcement actions. Um, the other thing that I would say is that Illinois is a good example of kind of some of the fundamental um, assumptions that many many proponents of private rights of action make um, that I just think aren't true. And, and I think one of those assumptions is that, um, you know, businesses uh, without a private right of action will willfully disregard a law. And, you know, no doubt with any statute, I'm sure you can, you know, dig up some bad actors. Um, but this that's not the point. Uh, here. The point here is that um, this is driving away good actors and that it's not a, an effective tool to winnow out uh, those who are uh, violating a law egregiously. Um, although certainly, you know, many of the practices that uh, Clearview did employ, you know, are generally, uh, you know, have been found objectionable by lots of folks, um, you know, that's one of, as I said, 1,100 class action lawsuits. Um, other states have found ways to go at that type of conduct uh, without this type of legislation. So again, I just would question whether that's ultimately, um, you know, the the right way of trying to get at that conduct when you are wrapping in so many other good actors. Um, and, and not only driving them away from Illinois, but leaving Illinois consumers unprotected. Um, so that's that's where where we end. So before I move on to our, our my final few questions for the panel, I would like to remind the, our attendees on Zoom that you can leave questions in the Q and A feature or in the chat feature, and for our panelists as well. Um, so. Building off of this kind of case study, for, for lack of a better term, that we've seen in Illinois versus Texas and Washington, but also thinking about what we've seen emerging at a state level, while I know many of us are concerned about the potential implications of a state patchwork of privacy laws, 
as was mentioned earlier, we are seeing renewed federal data privacy conversations, something that is exciting to many of us in the space, because I think I can say there there is pretty general agreement that a, a federal framework would be preferable to a, a state patchwork, even if there is uh, much debate about what that federal framework should actually look like. Thinking about what we've seen at a, a state level, and I'll start with, with you, Kier, what lessons should federal policymakers take away as they consider potential enforcement mechanisms in federal legislation around data privacy? Sure. So of the five kind of state comprehensive privacy laws that are currently in effect, uh, well, only one is currently in effect, and that is uh, California, the CCPA. And it has been mentioned that uh, the CCPA provides a very narrow private right of action just for data breach litigation. And for all the other consumer rights, protections, business obligations, the law is very clear, no private right of action, no standing to sue in a personal capacity based on one of those violations. However, to this point, we have seen dozens, if not hundreds of lawsuits filed in California citing the CCPA as an attempt at a basis to, uh, to get into court. And so that, it's been somewhat surprising to me, and I think it really underscores that in crafting a privacy law, it will be very important to get the scoping right and be very precise with statutory language when it comes to any inclusion of a private right of action, because any ambiguity or even any lack of ambiguity as is the case in California, is likely to be seized upon by both plaintiffs and defendants to try to broaden or narrow the scope of a private right of action beyond the drafter's intent. Andy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. What, what lessons would you like federal policymakers to, to take away from the current enforcement mechanisms we've seen in state? Laws? Sure. Well, I think, I think, you know, Keir's point is is very well taken. In the first six months of the CCPA uh, being in effect, we saw over fifty class action lawsuits filed trying to find you know what what we would call a, a backdoor uh, private right of action, whether it can be bootstrapped onto other statutes um, that allow a private right of action. Um, you know, we know that there will be an effort. So I think Keir's point about very precisely. Um, structuring that private right of action, if in fact one uh, is to be in federal law, um, will be incredibly important. But I think there are two other pieces here that go along with any kind of uh, individual redress. Um, and I do agree with Keir that I think, you know, my perception uh, is that at the federal level, there is, uh, you know, more tolerance or willingness to consider um, some mechanisms for this, uh, because it would necessarily in just be a single uh, process and system uh, versus when you're talking in the states, having the possibility of 50 different jurisdictions with 50 different um, uh, private rights of action. But there are two points that come along with this um, that I think are really good uh, lessons that feds can draw from the states. And the first is uh, the uh, the value of a right to cure. Um, and the second is preemption and the degree of preemption. So uh, as Keir said, California is the only uh, state in effect right now uh, with its privacy law. Um, and uh, for the last uh, four years, or excuse me, the last two years uh, that it's been in effect has had a right to cure. Now that that is being eliminated as of January 1st this year. But the California AG uh, released a report in January of this year stating that um, over 75% uh, of the businesses that it had sent a right to cure uh, led notice to had come into compliance. And what the right to cure is, is a, a short time period, 30 to 45 days, where once the attorney general uh, notices that business, uh, that there's been a violation or an alleged violation, business has that 30 to 45 day period, not only to fix it, but to uh, expressly state in writing that that particular issue will not happen again. Um, and so, you know, it's beneficial for the Attorney General's office, because it's a relatively um, low resource, but high impact way to ensure compliance. Um, and it benefits consumers, because the issue 
uh, that they've noticed or that they've flagged is resolved in a very short period of time. Um, and it's benefit it's beneficial to the businesses because again, it kind of winnows out the good actors versus the bad actors. These are very complex laws. They have a lot of lot of uh, granular requirements, and it's not difficult to oversee something or to not have prioritized something uh, in favor of a more impactful uh, privacy compliance uh, posture for another requirement. And so, um, you know, I think the right to cure has proven very valuable and a, and a very helpful tool um, that can help offset some of those risks of, of a private right of action. And I think the other piece that's absolutely critical here is the degree to which preemption comes into play. Again, I think um, you know there's less incentive to support individual redress if uh, businesses feel like there's still opportunities in the states to pass legislation uh, regarding the same topic with private rights of action. Um, then at that point, there's really no, uh, it's difficult to understand what the incentive would be uh, to um, support that at the federal level. Um, you know, I think this is those two pieces go hand in hand with, again, to Kier's point, that very carefully, precisely constructed uh, level of individual redress um, if privacy legislation is going to happen. So one of the issues with private rights of action and statutory damages is that there is often not a clear harm associated with the potential litigation that stems from the violations, but it can still be incredibly costly both to businesses and was mentioned earlier to consumers in the decision of companies whether or not to, to enter a certain market. Um, we often think of data privacy as a, a quote unquote tech issue. We're often hearing it brought up around social media companies or online behavior. But is this really a tech issue first off? And if so, are these questions of harm unique to kind of the, the digital space? And how should policymakers think about the question of harm when it comes to data privacy enforcement? And I'll let whichever of you wants to to start first, I know that's a, a question that is is very uh, very much in debate in data privacy these days. Of uh, what is what is harm? So I don't necessarily expect us to to solve this on the panel, but I'd like to get both of your thoughts on that question. Uh, I can lead off. Um, is this a tech issue? Increasingly, everything is a tech issue because everything is tech. More and more throughout the economy, data is collected, processed, used. Uh, to enable the delivery of uh, very beneficial services, but can also raise risks in uh, unconsenting or, or harmful uh, processing against consumer interests. So let's go back to the Illinois BIPA and take that as an example. Uh, there were certainly uh, potentially under that law, there have been costly settlement requirements and litigation for bare procedural violations for kind of not crossing your I's or dotting your T's in a written consent flow. However, uh, when we're talking about biometric data, we have to recognize that that is kind of one of the more sensitive categories of information. It's often said, you know, you can change your password, uh, you can even change your social security number, but it is much, much harder to actually change your face. And to many people, having your face scanned without your knowledge or consent, a face print lifted uh, from that image and added to a perpetual lineup, that can be used to track, identify, or render adverse judgments against you at some point in the future, even without a separate economic harm, that can constitute a very objectionable personal invasion of privacy, kind of a, a clear harm. And now, obviously, there are plenty of Article 3 kind of standing issues and what does or does not constitute a cognizable injury. But however, as we seek to pass privacy laws and support privacy, uh, a major purpose of doing so is to ensure that uh, the tech and broader industry can maintain uh, consumers' trust in uh, digital pro products and services. And I don't think policymakers should uh, overlook these interests and sensitivities. They must be accounted for. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't disagree with that, Karen. I think privacy is certainly becoming, um, you know, a, a market force on the business side as well. Businesses know that being uh, more uh, responsive to consumers on their privacy issues 
uh, can be a, an advantage uh, in the market as well. Um, so I think that's true. I, I think, it, you know, the BIPA is interesting. I think um, when we think about the degree of injury uh, or, you know, what standing might look like, actually taking one of the uh, comprehensive bills in the states is kind of an interesting thought exercise. Um, you know, most uh, three out of the four bills require opt-in consent for sensitive data, as Kier was uh, referencing with, with the BIPA. Uh, legislation and that sensitive data uh, in those bills are are largely defined as precise geolocation information, biometric information, health diagnoses, uh, children's information, etc. Um, so, if a business fails to obtain opt-in consent to process that data, um, I think that you know really could constitute um, you know something that could be a cognizable harm depending on how that data was then processed. Uh, there are other requirements in the bills that I would submit have, you know, much less of a direct uh, injury on an entity, uh, excuse me, on an individual. So, for instance, if uh, a business, most of the bill or all of the bills require uh, businesses' privacy policies to lay out the categories of information that they are collecting. So, if you, if a business unintentionally leaves out a category of information that it is collecting or a category of entity that it may be sharing uh, information with in their privacy policy, that strikes me as, you know, less of a uh, violation that would uh, directly cause harm to the consumer. And again, you know, certainly all, all um, depending on, on how the business uses that information. But um, I think it's, again, you know, the any private right of action that is in federal law is going to have to be very, very precisely uh, drafted. Um, I think, again, at, at the state level, there's there's just been a consensus that these bills are so complex that the requirements are very granular, um, that it's going to take businesses a while to uh, really get into a true compliance posture, given how complex and costly it is. Uh, that that's just not the right mechanism uh, at the state level. Well, I thank you both for your time. It's kind of a, a closing statement. I would just ask you both to end with, what advice would you have for policymakers if you could just give them one piece of advice to, to think about when it comes to this question of private rights of action, either at a state or a federal le level. Andy, since I let you get the first opening statement, Kira, I'll let you get the kind of first closing statement. Sure. So again, I would just have to return to the recommendation that private rights of action should not be considered an all or nothing proposition. As I've mentioned, there are many different kind of constraints and protections that uh, could be included to allow uh, consumers to seek uh, self-help when there's a very objectionable violation of their privacy interests while uh, trying to put the lid on some of these kind of nuisance lawsuits. Uh, there's many uh, great resources out there that try to lay out uh, some of these uh, different uh, levers and uh, tools that can be uh, pulled here. And I would uh, point to the Future Privacy Forum, uh, my organization that has uh, tried to do a lot of uh, smart thinking about uh, some of these available options. Thanks, Kier. Um, I, I would go back to the criticality of the, of the right to cure. Um, I think at the end of the day, the most important thing is uh, not only letting businesses comply with the law and encouraging compliance over punishment, um, but to ensuring that you have mechanisms to uh, separate uh, good actors who have committed an unintentional violation, um, but who are in good faith attempting to comply, again, with a very complex law, um, and businesses who are, you know, maybe those bad actors who are, are willfully ignoring uh, compliance with the law. So um, in my mind, you know, that's a very, very effective tool uh, that has to be looked at um, in conjunction, as well as a strong preemption, uh, whether at the state or federal level, 
to ensure that there is a single enforcement uh, body and, and uh, a single set of laws and requirements that businesses can comply with. Well, thank you again both for your time. With that, I'll turn it back over to Kayla from the Regulatory Transparency Project for some closing comments. Absolutely. On behalf of both myself and the Regulatory Transparency Project, I want to thank all our experts for sharing their time and expertise. And I want to thank our audience for tuning in and participating. We welcome listener feedback at rtp at regproject.org. If you're interested for more from us at RTP, you can continue to follow us at regproject.org and also find us on all major social media platforms. Again, thank you all for joining us today. And until next time, we are adjourned. <laughs>